For 160 million years, the dinosaurs ruled the planet. From their humble progenitors in the Triassic to the tyrant lizard king of the late Cretaceous, Dinosauria was a clade unmatched in its dominion. And then, 66 million years ago, that came to an abrupt and near total end. With the sole exception of Aves, every clade of dinosaur went extinct. But what if they hadn't? Dragons of the Cenozoic follows the development of a world where the KPG event took place but where a little bit of luck allowed a handful of species of non-avian dinosaurs to survive in a refugium in eastern Antarctica. This is the story of how the greatest dynasty the world has ever known recovered in a world it no longer ruled. The low grumble of an angry boar Eocastros rolls over the water lily as the pig-sized cornoderm flares its bright red nostrils at its rival. The water dances along its back as the old boar sings an infrasound intimidation song. A complex mixture of audio and visual displays is used by both the older resident male and his younger rival before the two commit to their ritualized combat. But when at last they have finished their dueling songs, they push forward through the water lily. Their momentum carries them past each other, and for a moment it seems as if they will pass one another altogether. But they have not overshot their target. They are exactly where they want to be. Raising the osteoderm makokwitl at the end of their tails, they strike with thunderous cracks, battering each other. As armored tail slams against armored hide, a nearby Merambiotherium waddles out of the water. Like the larger cornoderms, the beaver-like Gondwanathir spends much of its time in the water, feeding off of lilies and azola to bulk up for the coming winter. But an accidental swipe of an armored tail would be enough to rend flesh and shatter bone. So for now, it wants to be as far away from the battling males as possible. On the shore of the Antarctic lake, a family of very different Thyreophorans nervously paces as they cautiously watch the battle in the water. This hoplophosphorus buck already went through his own ritualized mating combat at the dawn of the spring. The four-month-old chicks surrounding him are a testament to his success. He has no interest in the fighting of these ferocious boars, and so he turns to lead his family to a quieter watering hole. Beneath the churned-up surface waters, another Thyreophorin bites into the roots of an Alumbo water lily as she bulks up to lay her own clutch of eggs. She has no time for the conflict of her larger cousins. Before too long, summer will end, and she and her future brood will have to be buried deep in their burrows, emerging only occasionally to hunt fish when the darkness of the winter night puts Antarctica's plants to sleep. And so, life moves on for the armored Tarasks of Paleocene Antarctica, as they do their best to prepare for the dark to come. Hello everyone, Finn here. In the 740,000 years since the KPG extinction, the ecological dominance of fungal and fern landscapes, characteristics of the immediate post-impact period, have long since given way to more complex and stable ecosystems. Within their more robust and diverse environments, the surviving Thyreophorans have followed suit, diversifying into a variety of forms. Over the 20th and 21st centuries, the classification of extant Thyreophorans has undergone significant revisions as new fossil evidence and molecular analysis have shaped their taxonomic framework. Early naturalists traditionally classified all surviving armored taxa within Thyreophora as a monophyletic group. Aquilohippoidea. This clade included the groups Titanogryphia, Notohippogryphia, Pachygryphia, Testudoloxodonta, Aspidocolonia, and Chelosoma. This taxonomic approach mirrored the historical misclassifications in mammalian phylogeny of our own world, such as the now defunct order Pachydermata, 
which erroneously grouped elephants, rhinos, and hippos together based on shared morphological traits rather than any kind of evolutionary relationships. However, subsequent phylogenetic analysis has demonstrated that Chelosoma, Testuloxodonta, and Aspidocolonia are far outside of Aquilohippoidea, in, and in their own grouping dubbed Cornodermata. With Cornodermata and Aquilohippoidea having last shared a common ancestor during the early Jurassic, approximately 190 million years ago. Paleontologists have established that the three surviving families belong to a single lineage, remnants of a once more diverse group of robust cornoderms. In the world of dragons of the Cenozoic, Cornodermata is most analogous to what we would call Euripoda, a clade that includes Stegosauria and Ankylosauria. However, due to the persistence of paraankylosaurs into the Cenozoic, contemporary zoologists have classified what we would consider paraankylosauria as the clade Eucornodermia, while the extinct Euankylosaurs of our world are called Pseudocornodermia. And yes, this is a retcon. As the basal most identified member of Chelosoma, Eo testudoides provides valuable insight into how cornoderms managed to survive the KPG extinction. Eo testudoides was not a large animal. Measuring between 45 and 50 centimeters in body length, it was significantly smaller than even the very diminutive Mastrixian stegaros. In contrast to its predominantly herbivorous and heavily armored Mesozoic relatives, Eo testudoides exhibits adaptations indicative of a semi-aquatic lifestyle, paralleling speculative reconstructions of Leoningosaurus paradoxus. The absence of fusion between its spinal and hip bones represents a key adaptation to its semi-aquatic niche, enhancing flexibility and facilitating movement through aquatic environments. This ecological shift provided access to a broad spectrum of nutritional resources, securing an adaptive niche that helped the group endure the environmental upheaval of the KPG event. Central to Eo testudoides' survival was its generalist dietary strategy. Unlike the contemporaneous freshwater mosasaurs and plesiosaurs, whose piscivorous and macro-predatory specializations made them vulnerable to ecosystem collapse, Eo testudoides exploited a diverse array of food sources, including small fish, crustaceans, insects, mollusks, and plant matter such as roots and tubers. This dietary flexibility gave it a competitive edge in the resource-scarce post-impact world. While exclusively carnivorous endothermic marine reptiles were unable to survive the trophic collapse. Additionally, Eo testudoides, like all dinosaurs, was endothermic, setting it apart from the ectothermic reptiles such as crocodilians and turtles which also survived. While crocodilians and turtles were able to persist in most of their ranges, Due to their low metabolic demands, they still experienced localized extirpations from much of southern Gondwana, especially Antarctica, during the impact winter. Endothermy coupled with burrowing behavior, or at least the use of natural shelters, likely provided Eo testudoides with thermal buffering and a protection from climate extremes during this difficult period, positioning it well for survival when the worst of the extinction had passed. Beyond the absence of fusion between its spine and its hip bones, Eo testudoides possessed cranial adaptations that further supported its semi-aquatic lifestyle. These included elevated nostrils and orbits, analogous to those of modern crocodilians, allowing it to remain partially submerged while maintaining sensory awareness above the water's surface. This adaptation enabled it to detect both prey and predators while resting at the bottom of bodies of water or when surfacing. From Eo testudoides and Chelosoma as a whole, two divergent clades would arrive, Testudoloxodonta and Aspidocolonia. Testudoloxodonta transitioned into a terrestrial existence, developing reinforced limbs and adopting a predominantly herbivorous lifestyle, filling the now vacant niche left by the extinction of the pseudocornoderms. In contrast, Aspidocolonia retained and refined its semi-aquatic heritage, evolving into a 
clade of robust benthic feeders and seagrass grazers. The discovery of eocastros within the Sabro formation further exemplifies the rapid diversification of eucornoderms in the aftermath of the KPG extinction. Unlike its smaller but more generalist relative eotestudoides, eocastros attained a size comparable almost to stegaros of the Maastrichtian, demonstrating how quickly the lineage adapted to exploit the now available ecological niches. Retaining several anatomical features of its predecessors, Eocastros still had elevated eyes and nostrils, a feature analogous to modern hippopotamus, allowing it to remain largely submerged while still breathing and monitoring its surroundings, an advantageous trait in its lacustrian and riverine habitats. However, despite its larger size, Eocastros had not yet fully abandoned burrowing behavior. Fossil evidence suggests that individuals may have still excavated or utilized existing burrows, particularly during the long dark of the Paleocene winters. This behavior likely provided insulation against temperature fluctuations and refuge from predators, ensuring the species' survival in a climate that, while warmer than present-day Antarctica, still imposed seasonal hardships. Dietary analysis of Eocastros indicates a shift towards greater herbivory compared to its omnivorous cousin. Though it retained significant dietary flexibility, fossilized gut content and isotope analysis suggest that it fed extensively on floating and emergent aquatic vegetation such as nodonufar and nalumbo water lilies as well as the ubiquitous azola water ferns. It also incorporated terrestrial flora into its diet, including the Antarctic nothofagus trees and other angiosperms. This allowed Eocastros to exploit multiple feeding grounds within its environment. The emergence of Eocastros in less than a million years after the KPG extinction underscores the evolutionary plasticity of life, particularly in response to ecological upheaval. While Eotestudoides occupied a generalized semi-aquatic niche, virtually unchanged since the KPG, Eocastros represents an early step towards increased size and specialization, paving the way for future evolutionary radiations. The second major thyreophoran clade represented in the Sabro formation is Aquilohippoidea, which includes an indeterminate species of Eoaspisaurus alongside the significantly larger Hoplophosphorus. As with its late Cretaceous ancestor Jacopil, Hoplophosphorus exhibited the highly derived dental and mandibular adaptations that, dist that distinguish Aquilohippoids from more basal thyreophorans such as Celadosaurus. While these more primitive thyreophorans employed simple shearing teeth for full livery, the advanced mastication mechanics of hoplophosphorus and other aquilohippoids suggests an ability to process more fibrous or abrasive vegetation. This has fueled the ongoing debate regarding the presence and ecological significance of grass in Maxtristian and Paleocene Gondwana. The co-occurrence of hoplophosphorus with hypsodont gondwanotherian mammals further complicates this discussion, as both clades exhibit morphological adaptations typically associated with grazing. Some researchers propose that these traits evolved in response to grass consumption, indicating an earlier proliferation of grasses in Gondwanan ecosystems than was traditionally assumed. Alternatively, it's been suggested that the development of hypsodonty in Gondwanotheres and the mastication adaptations of Aquilohippoids may have arisen as an adaptation to process ash-laden vegetation, a consequence of increased volcanic activity associated with the rising Andes. However, the presence of hypsodont Gondwanotheres in Madagascar and India, where they coexisted with grasses, suggests that at least some early Paleocene ecosystems supported true grazing niches. The diet of Hoplophosphorus also provides insight into the evolutionary drivers behind neck elongation in Aquilohippoids. While some later highly derived families, such as the sauropod mimic Titanogryphia, were undoubtedly adapted to high browsing niches, Many long-necked aquilohippoids appear to have primarily consumed grasses, despite possessing cervical proportions that rival those of modern giraffes. This paradox has given rise to competing theories regarding the selective pressures responsible for neck elongation in the clade. 
As with giraffids, both sexual selection and dietary specialization have been proposed as primary drivers of cervical elongation. Fossil evidence from the sabral indicates that Hoplophosphorus was already undergoing significant modifications to its cervical vertebrae, including increased length and reinforced musculature. These structures suggest that beyond potential browsing advantages, neck elongation may have been primarily driven by interspecific combat with individuals using their lengthened necks and reinforced musculature to batter competitors with the armored osteoderms on their necks. As new discoveries continue to refine our understanding of these enigmatic taxa, their complex histories remind us that survival is not merely a matter of the fittest or endurance, but of adaptability. Whether through ecological flexibility, shifts in feeding strategies, novel anatomical modifications, or simple chance, these once overlooked survivors of the Mesozoic carved out new niches in a radically altered world. Their evolutionary paths serve as a testament of the unpredictability yet opportunistic nature of these dragons of the Cenozoic. Thanks for watching everyone. This episode was supposed to come out two weeks ago, but unfortunately life got in the way. The Q&A video will be out next Thursday with another video next Monday. So if you have any more questions that you didn't ask in the comment section of the previous video, be sure to ask them here before Tuesday. Now time to discuss the big change. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, the survival of para-ankylosaurs is a significant retcon to the established list of survivors. I had initially intended for aquilohippoids to diverge into more gracile aquilohippid and a separate lineage that is more convergent on the body plan of ankylosaurs, which were going to be called cornoderms. However, after looking at the diminutive stegaros, I started thinking more and more about how more derived thyreophorans could have survived. The postulated semi-aquatic nature of Liaoningosaurus really struck me as a novel way to make that happen. I tried to ensure that the circumstances and forces of survival were just as plausible as those of the other surviving dinosaurs. So I hope everyone is on board with this retcon. Thanks for watching until the end of the video, and don't forget to like and subscribe. See you guys soon.